Well, I hope that the past few weeks you've been blessed by the messages presented by our guests. Um, this morning, I want to get back into our series about the promise in Hebrews, the book of Hebrews. I was going to preach a Thanksgiving message today, but um, in like late October, I was like, you know, if I, if I time this right, I can preach on Melchizedek the week of Thanksgiving, and I did that for a purpose, and so it didn't just land on this day. I had to do some planning around other people that were going to be here as well and make it work, so it actually did work out, and I'm thankful for that. Um, you would have had like a throwaway sermon in October or something, you know, if, if I had to make sure that it would land on the right Sunday. Letting you in on something, okay? Um, this is the most misunderstood portion of, this, of the service. Because I'm up here. And I think that sometimes I say things and I don't fully explain. That's what I love about Melchizedek. Because there's four short verses in the Old Testament and nobody explains Until you get to Hebrews. You have to wait thousands of years before an explanation is actually given. Now, there are many writings, actually. There are many writings in commentaries about the law, commentaries about Moses' writing, particularly Genesis. Genesis is a pretty, pretty thick book. There's a lot in there. There's several, several Generations, a couple thousand years, actually, in just the first book of the Bible. And then things kind of pick up. It's interesting. So before I actually preach Hebrews 7, I want to read these brief passages in the Old Testament to kind of set up what we have, scripturally speaking, about Melchizedek before we actually go into the explanation that's in Hebrews. I also say this, I've, I've said a lot of things in my time here at Bible Christian Church behind this pulpit that have been very misunderstood, and one of them was something that I said when I very first got here, and I said it that whole year, I said I'm trying to preach myself out of a job, and I'm still trying to do that. But even if I say that, I don't, I'm not gonna take the whole time to explain what I mean. I really am trying to preach myself out of a job. There comes a point that's spoken about in the New Testament where the church reaches maturity. And that scripture actually says that that's the reason pastors and preachers and evangelists and ministers are given until the church reaches the full stature of the body of Christ. And so I feel like we are being babysat by preachers and pastors and elders and deacons. i just be real honest with you about my feelings. I could be wrong. I feel like we've been in the childhood infancy stage for 2,000 years. My brief, brief study of the church history is we've, we still fight like little kids, even to this day. My wife likes to say to me, you know, you're the spoiled brat of the king. <laughs> and that's because of like the rest of you. We really are God's children. Spoiled, blessed beyond measure. We have no clue how good we got it. We really don't. We, we, we got to be thankful. And this has been a challenge for me to study this and to find something of worth to share with you. But even so, there will be those that, because of whatever reason, maybe it's my wrinkly shirt or they just don't like me, they won't listen to what I have to say. And because they don't really actually believe in what the scripture says, they're not gonna hear that either. And, I, and I'm fully aware of that. Nevertheless, 
I was very encouraged by Dr. Chuck last week in his desire for souls. And he sat me down one time and asked me what was really important to me. Now to him, he's, he really is an evangelist. I, I'm really not. Um, what's really on my heart, what really actually bothers me, I was told once by a counselor, whatever bothers you might be the thing you're supposed to serve or help in, you know, that if that actually bothers you, maybe you should do something about it. And I, I had to really whittle down what it is that actually bothered me. And what bothered me is the people of God not knowing what the scripture actually says. That bothers me. We have a lot of interpretations about Melchizedek, and I have to get this out of the way from the jump. I don't believe Melchizedek is Christ in the Old Testament. And there are people that do. And there are people that teach that. Nowhere will you find a verse where it says that Melchizedek actually is Jesus. Now, everything about him points to Jesus. But he's another person that visits Abraham, and he's called by a name, and he's not called the Lord. Now, when the angels saved Lot out of Sodom and Gomorrah, there were three men that came to Abraham. Two of them went to Sodom and Gomorrah. The one man that stayed behind, the scripture says implicitly that that was the Lord. So when the Lord appears to Abraham, the scriptures actually says it's the Lord. So in these passages, you're gonna find that it doesn't actually call Melchizedek Jesus. It doesn't call him the Lord. But pay close attention to the details that are given about him because he looks a lot like Jesus. That's what's significant. All right. Have I bored you to tears yet? All right, here we go. Before we get into our text, like I said, we're going to go to the Old Testament. Uh, real short verses, so it should be quick and painless, unlike my preaching. So Genesis 14, starting in verse 14 to just set up a little bit of context. Abraham's brother Lot, or cousin, however you want to look at it. Scripture calls him a brother, but other passages they do allude to him being the, anyways. All right, he's family. It says brother, so let's just go with brother. There in verse 14, when Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night, and he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. So he brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother Lot and his goods, as well as the women and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shavah, that is the king's valley, after his return from the defeat. Ah, this king. Kedor Leomer. I'm, I'm not even saying that right, I don't think. But Shedor Leomer. There it is. And the kings who were with him. He had three kings with him. This king, Abraham, defeated. Then Melchizedek, or Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. Other passages says, and Abraham gave Melchizedek a tithe of all. That's it. No more mention of him until Psalms. No explanation. Because the story moves on. This is all that's mentioned. These are all the details that are given of Melchizedek. He's called Melchizedek king of Salem, Melchizedek, which is interesting because we'll say his, he, his, uh, his Semitic name, can't really verify if it necessarily is Hebrew, it's probably Chaldean because of the area that they're in. Melchizedek, Semitic languages are very similar. Melech Shalom. Melchizedek, king of Salem. For some reason we give his title in English but his name in the Hebrew or Semitic language. He brings out bread and wine. He's the priest of the Most High God, and he blesses Abraham. And Abraham gives him a tithe. That's it. That is all the details were given. 
And then we go to Psalm chapter 110, a Psalm of David. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Now we know the Lord Jesus Christ is sitting at the right hand of God the Father. This is a prophecy about Jesus Christ. And his ancestor David, the king, has written a psalm prophesying about Jesus Christ. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power and the beauty of holiness. From the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. I love saying it that way, Melchizedek. I just, I heard an old, I heard an old rabbi say that in a video. That's how he pronounced it. And so it stuck with me, Melchizedek. And he said it this way, it's Melchizedek. All right, all right. The Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. I think that that scripture should be read every election day. (laughs) It's interesting because David knows his history. He mentions that the Lord has sworn. The Lord has sworn you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. But David never gives us a reference of where the Lord actually said this. But then he says, the Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. When Melchizedek showed up, Abraham had just got done defeating four kings. If you seek office, if you seek leadership, beware. The Lord will execute heads of state in the day of his wrath. Not all of them, but he does say that he will execute them in the day of his wrath. He says it twice. Remember, when things are mentioned a couple times, it's important. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. Beware seeking political office because you are held to a higher standard. He shall drink of the brook by the wayside, therefore he shall lift up the head. Let's go to our text in Hebrews 7. All right. He begins to explain. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. That's the tithe. A tithe means a tenth. A tenth part of all, all the spoil that he got from the kings that he fought with. First being translated king of righteousness. That's what his name literally means. Melchizedek, king of righteousness. And Melech Shalom, king of Salem or king of peace. Without father, without mother, without genealogy. Having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the son of God, remains a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. What you'll notice in the book of Genesis, oftentimes when some characters are mentioned, even those wicked kings that are mentioned in Genesis chapter 14, where they come from is mentioned, oftentimes their father is mentioned. But when Melchizedek is mentioned in the scripture, No genealogy, no mention of a father, no mention of a homeland either. I mean, he's the king of Salem. Is is that a place or is that peace, literal peace? He's the king of peace. It could be Jerusalem. But there's no definitive source given from where he comes from. Even Elijah the prophet Elijah the prophet, when he's first mentioned, it's Elijah the Tishbite. We at least know what people he comes from. So if we know what people he comes from, then we can trace his genealogy because that name, often the names of those tribes go back to the original patriarch of that tribe. Like the tribe of Judah. The ancient ancestor of all those in the tribe of Judah was Judah. (laughs) But with Melchizedek, there's no genealogy. And the writer of Hebrews thought it necessary to tell the church and remind the church of this. This character shows up in Scripture. Consider how great this man was to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. 
Indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi, who receive the priesthood, have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Blessed him who had the promises. There's that word again, promise, promises. Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. The lesser is blessed by the better. It's obvious those who have give to those who don't. Those who are greater serve those who are lesser. See, we have it backwards in this world. People think that when you become great, others should serve you. But Jesus said, the greatest among you shall be his servant. The lesser is blessed by the better. The lesser is supposed to be blessed by the greater. God bless the old men and women who understand this. That they've not been raised up to be honored, but that they should bestow honor and blessing on those who come after them. This is what we mean when we speak of legacy. You've not been raised up so everyone can worship you and bless and serve you. You've been raised up so you can serve those who come after you. The greatest among you is a servant, blessed by the better. Here mortal men receive tithes, and there he receives them of whom it is witnessed that he lives. Even Levi, who received tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. In other words, Levi wasn't even born yet, but he's saying, he's given an illustration here, because the timeless nature of God, it's not because of Levi, it's not because of Abraham, Levi received tithes paid through Abraham while he was still in his loins. In other words, he hadn't been born. He was still in the body. It was still in him. He hadn't been born yet. I'm all for women's rights. But just because you're inside somebody's body doesn't mean you're not significant. And I know I, 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 I divide people with this, but I find opportunities to say it when I'm in the pulpit. Your body does not belong to you. If you are pregnant with a child in your womb, that body doesn't belong to you either. The scripture says you have been bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body and your spirit, which belong to God. Levi's paying tithe, so to speak, while he's still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. You see, we have to stop relegating our lives from the time we first cry to the time we leave this tent. Because the life is not made up of the things you possess. Do you know that you possess this tent? When we talk about possession, most people think about demonic possession. Your spirit is literally possessing this body. Just like if you were in your house taking possession of it, moving into it. And Jesus said our life does not consist of the things that we possess. That's why he could say lay up treasures for yourself in heaven. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We treasure this flesh way too much. The real us is merely moving through this flesh. Let me move on. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law. Now I know I got that feeling as I'm reading this. Paul said this, even to this day, when Moses is read, there's a veil upon the heart. But when anyone turns to Christ, the veil shall be removed. I believe that's 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Don't quote me on that because I'm not good with addresses. I do know he said it to the Corinthians. To this day, when Moses is read, when we're talking about what Moses said, when we're talking about the scriptures of the Old Testament, especially the law, there's a veil upon the heart. And I, 
I apologize if this makes you sleepy. And the only, only solution I have for you is turn to Jesus Christ so the veil can be taken away. Or maybe I need to be a better preacher. I don't know. It's one of those. I'm trudging through this with you. I really believe in the commandment that Paul gives to Timothy. You know what he tells Timothy? He never tells Timothy to preach good sermons. You know what he says? Focus. This is the word that's actually used in the English Standard Version. He tells Timothy, focus on the public reading of Scripture, then doctrine. So here we go. What further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek? Do you believe that the word of God has the power to convert the soul? That's what, that's what the psalm says in Psalm 119, that the word of God is pure, converting the soul. I love that there's never a verse where it says the preacher is a great speaker and orator converting the soul. I've said something, I've said something to a couple of my friends and they always say the same thing. They always say the same thing. They're always like, just give people real bread and they'll be fed and satisfied. Do you believe that Jesus is real bread, real drink, his blood, real drink? You believe that his word is the words of life. He says, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. The word of God is sharp. Those of you that know me intimately know that I love awkwardness. I am selfishly entertained by it. Therefore, if perfection were, th- were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? You know, if you were to hear something the preacher said and it was to lead you into thinking about what Jesus has done for you, I think he did his job. Do you know that there's a spiritual warfare happening right now in this church, right in this instant? People don't want to hear the word of God. They're tired of hearing the word of God. They'd rather Google and look something else up, be on social media, be distracted by something else because they don't actually want to hear what the scripture says. They just want to have things their way. I'm here to tell you, this ain't Burger King, all right? You don't get to have things your way. Mm, mm, mm. Anyone ever been with like close friends and like trouble walked into the room and you could just feel it? Why, why this fight against the preacher and against the scripture? I've had a man say to me one time, get on with it. And I say, where are we going? See, it's dangerous for a guy like me to be the preacher because I, I disrespect pomp and circumstance a lot. Situation. And I buck. <sighs> Takes a big God to wrestle this guy to the ground and make me behave. And I don't want to behave. Let's just be honest. <laughs> what further need was there for another priest that should arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? Why a different priesthood? For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. Spoiler, it's Judah. That's who he's getting ready to say. Now he'll say this. He'll say in the next verse. It is evident that our Lord Jesus Christ arose from Judah of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. It was the tribe of Levi that were supposed to be the priests. Aaron's descendants. And it is yet far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest. Why? Think of the setup. He said, no genealogy. Father and mother's never mentioned. Where did he come from? Where did you come from? Where did you go? Not, we're not talking about Cotton Eye Joe here. 
Melchizedek, we don't know where it came from. We don't know where he went. I think that's funny. We don't know where he came from. We don't know. And anyone that tries to tell you they do is lying because the scriptures never tell us. That is what the writer of Hebrews is feeding on. That's what he's making his argument with. He's going to tell us, who has come not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. The scriptures never mention his beginning or his end. He is signaling to us with great big signal lights and flares. Uh, 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 pay attention. You don't know where he came from. You don't know where he's going. And Jesus is, asked, is told by his disciples, Lord, we, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus says, I am the way. <laughs> and he tells them immediately in that, he says, I came from the Father, and I'm going to the Father. It's not according to the law of a fleshly commandment. See, the Levites were priests because the law commanded that they should be. But it's not according to the law's power that Christ is our high priest. It's according to the power of an endless life. For he testifies, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Forever is the key word in that prophecy. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. He's saying that the order of Melchizedek is an endless ministry. It's an eternal priesthood. There are many things that we do not understand, and we're going to be so surprised when we get to meet all these people. There's going to be so much that we see and so many questions answered. And what's so funny is none of us who are believers are going to fight it. Once it's shown to us, we're going to be like, oh, we're so ignorant. We're just going to be surprised. I don't think there's going to be any bitterness or ill will. Like, well, why didn't you explain? <laughs> Sorry. All right. For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the for former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect. The law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope. There's that word better. Better hope, better promises, better covenant. These are the kind of phrases that are used in the book of Hebrews. This is better things. That's a phrase used in the book of Hebrews several times. Better things, better hope through which we draw near to God. Spoiler alert, it's Jesus. And, and as much as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, he's talking about the Levites, they didn't have to swear anything. They were just born into the right family. They didn't have an oath. They didn't have a promise. They were just born into the right family. But he with an oath by him who said to him, the Lord has sworn, the Lord has made an oath, the Lord has promised and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. We are not under the old covenant. If anyone comes to you trying to get you to fulfill the old covenant law, a curse be upon them. That's what Paul said. I'm just paraphrasing his words in Galatians. You know that the law brings a curse? You know how the law brings a curse? The old covenant law brings a curse because you're a sinner, because I'm a sinner. We've broken that law. We cannot be made justified by that law. Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law and the prophets, but to fulfill. Jesus Christ is the one who fulfills the old covenant for us on our behalf. And he becomes the surety of a better covenant. It's the covenant that we spoke about today when we took communion. He's the surety of a better covenant. That he's the guarantor. A surety is like a, a, a bail bond. A bail bondsman represents you in court to make sure that you will show up. If we bail you out of jail, he will make his court date. Now, if you don't make your court date, that bounty is going to turn into a, a, a little leaflet sent to bounty hunters to come get you and drag you to court. A surety is given. 
to make sure you appear. Surety can also be like, you ever, you ever signed a note on a car and had to have like your parents or your brother or somebody sign the note with you to co-sign? A surety that you'll actually pay what you owe. Jesus is the surety of a better covenant. He's the guarantee of the covenant. He's the one who gave his body and his blood, and he says his blood is the blood of the new covenant. This is why I wanted to preach this right before Thanksgiving. Why do we eat so much? You ever wonder that? Well, because we're thankful. God has given us a bountiful harvest. We got the cornucopia of food and blessing. Let us feast on turkey, mashed potatoes. I'm getting hungry thinking about it. Did you ever notice every important thing has a meal attached to it? Did you ever notice that? Every important thing has a meal attached to it. This might just be the fat boy speaking. There's a fat boy living in me. There's a fat boy living in me. Y'all yeah, don't know that song. Um, Why do we give Santa Claus milk and cookies? He got a lot of houses to hit. Sugar, sugar's quick energy, right? We give him milk and cookies. Did you ever notice? We give him milk and cookies, and he gives us gifts. Melchizedek brought bread and wine, and Abraham gave him gifts. We go to Christmas. There's a ham or a goose or a turkey also at Christmas, and we exchange gifts. There's this exchange of food and gifts. Where did we get that from? Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. I give you a meal. My flesh is real bread. My blood is real drink. And I give you the gift of eternal life. In this exchange, Jesus gives all and we receive. Never thought about that, did you? Milk and cookies. You know, cookies is just bread with a lot of sugar in it. It's the same stuff. It's flour, it's eggs, and milk, and a lot of sugar. Bread is flour and eggs and milk and a little bit of sugar. And some salt, a little bit of yeast to make it blow up, right? And we don't give Santa the fruit of the vine, we give him the fruit of the bovine. Right? Everything is pointing to Jesus. That's actually the point of Melchizedek. You realize that? His name, his title, the food he brings... Everything about Melchizedek is pointing you to Jesus Christ. This is why I understand why people would confuse him with Christ and think he is Jesus. It makes sense. It's like, I'm not surprised that people think that. The only reason I don't think that is because the scriptures never say that. He looks so much like Jesus that we mistake him for Jesus. What about you? What about me? Do we look enough like Jesus that some people might mistake us? Have you ever had a perfect stranger show up at just the right time and then they disappeared and you were like, I think that was an angel. What if it was just a Jesus follower doing what he was supposed to do? And it wasn't actually an angel, it was just another man like Melchizedek, a man. Who do people see when they see you? What details of your life point people to Jesus Christ? Melchizedek, Melech Shalom, King of Righteousness, King of Salem. Jesus is the surety of a better covenant, better things built on better promises. There were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing 
Priest died, so you had to have another. That's why there's many. That's all that means. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Jesus Christ is alive forevermore. Unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives. He always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices for his own sins. He doesn't need to offer up sacrifices for his own sins. And then for the peoples, for he did this once for all, not for himself. Notice that. There's two distinctions, that the other priests, they give up sacrifices first for their own sins and then for the peoples. But when it comes to Jesus, he did this once for all. He didn't have to do it for himself because he was without sin. He gives himself up when he offered up himself. He did this once for all. For the law appoints as high priest men who have weakness, but the word of oath, the promise, the promise of God, which came after the law, appoints the son who has been perfected forever. Look back there at verse 25. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. I love it. Preachers have been saying it for years. He can save you from the guttermost to the uttermost. I love that. As low as you go, Jesus can save you to the uttermost. He always lives to make intercession for you. Sometimes with scripture, the pronouns mess us up, just like they do with some people in this world. Make a transition. Is this for you? He always lives to make intercession for me. I don't think you'll get in trouble if you was to write that in the margin of your Bible. Now, if you don't want to mark up your Bible, I understand. I respect your wishes. Me, I mark up my Bibles all the time. And in one of my Bibles, there's a little line that points out with a little arrow and it says, me. He's making intercession for me. Take it personal. Take it personal. That Christ is your high priest. He's making intercession for you. What does that mean? That he is speaking in the court of God on your behalf. That's what intercession literally is. On your behalf, he's the go-between between you and the courtroom of God. He's your lawyer, he's your advocate, he's making intercession for you. It could also be the idea of prayer, that he's praying for you consistently, always. Man, I thought it was awesome when I, when I heard my grandma prayed for me all the time. But then I read the scripture and it says, Jesus is praying for me all the time. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. No disrespect to grandmama. Mm. He is High priest forever. He's the eternal savior. He always lives to make intercession for us. And who else are you going to go to? To whom shall we go? Jesus' body pierced upon the cross is the bread of our communion. Jesus' blood shed upon the cross is the true fruit of the vine, for Jesus is the true vine. Remain in him and you shall live forever. And that's not on me. That's not a promise that I can make to you. I'm just telling you what the scripture, if you follow the line of scripture through, what it will teach you is that if you come to Jesus, remain in him, you will live forever. There's nowhere else to go. There's no one else who can save but Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus was talking to his disciples and he said, you guys are gonna leave too? And Peter said, I love this, to whom shall we go? You're the ones with the words of life. There's nowhere else to go, Lord. You're the one with the words of eternal life. Jesus said, I'll remind you again, he said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I've heard many times Christians saying things that, I don't understand this, I don't understand that. You know, and I've heard us, I don't understand why people follow the Pope. I don't understand why people have priests. I don't understand that. It's like, you should understand that. Here's what I understand. I understand why people would want to follow a Pope. Because they want someone with authority that can stand between them and a holy God. And for a lot of people, Catholics mainly, the Pope looks like he might be that guy because he wears a big hat, I guess. I don't know. He's dressed in white. 
No disrespect. If you're Catholic and you're watching this, I'm telling you, you don't need the Pope as your go-between because Jesus Christ is already your way. He is your intercessor. Amen. He's your mediator. You can come directly to Jesus. No one comes to the Father except through me. No disrespect to the Pope, but Jesus is greater. And there are some, you need a priest that's swinging an incense burner. You need to sit in a little room and tell him your sins. Tell Jesus. Come to Jesus. Jesus said, if you come to me, I will not turn you away. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. You can come directly to the Lord. You don't need to go between. Listen, we should be careful, independent, non-denominational, Protestant believers, <laughs> whatever you want to label yourselves as. Be very careful when you talk about Mary. Be very careful. There are people that pray to Mary, and I want to say lovingly, you don't have to go to his mother. You can go directly to the Lord, and no disrespect to Mary. Listen, I hate it when people talk bad about my mom. And Mary was chosen by God to bear his son. Be very careful disrespecting the queen. I'm not saying Mary's the queen of heaven, okay? Because I know immediately people think that. If the king chooses a woman to bear her son, what does that make her? Whew. His bride. You know that that's what we call the church? We're called the bride of Christ. Be very careful insulting another man's wife. So I, I'm saying this as respectful as possible. If we got anybody that's Catholic listening, I love Mary too. I think she's got one of the best sermons that I've ever heard in my entire life. And I wish I could be this brief. But nevertheless, I'm long-winded. Mary preached the best sermon in the world. She says to his servants, whatever he says, do it. Go on, mama. Yes. Praise the Lord, mammy. Nevertheless, Jesus is the way. No one comes to the Father except through me, he says. It's not through Mary. It's not through your priest. It's not through the Pope. It's not going to be through your grandma. There are some of us, our only religion that we have, our only spirituality came from grandma, came from Mima. Because she had faith, now I'm a Christian. You got to come to Jesus yourself. I cannot stress this enough. You have got to come to Jesus yourself. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Come to Jesus. Come to the Father. He's welcoming you. He is your priest. He is the one that makes your offering acceptable. Offer him your life. Offer him your life. Give it over to Jesus. Will you stand with me for a word of prayer? Father God, thank you for this opportunity to preach your word. I pray, Lord, that if... who, Lord, I said a lot. If I said anything that's not of you, I pray, Lord, for your mercy. Uh, <laughs> show me mercy. And show these people mercy and let them not be led astray by my foolishness. But I trust that any time your word is spoken, that your word itself can stand. Lord, your word is powerful through the mouth of a donkey. So I think you can speak through a guy like me. Give me the words now to invite. Give me the words now to invite. Father, I ask that you would bring souls to you, that people would be drawn to you. And maybe they're drawn to the church, maybe they're drawn to the music, maybe they're drawn to the preacher, maybe they're drawn to one of the elders or somebody here that they look up to. 
I pray, Lord, that all this that we've done, that all of it, that we would all give it up to you. And everything we've done, the music, the preaching, the elders, the deacons, everything, that we would be leading people directly to you. Let your Holy Spirit work in this place, I pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Now is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. The time has come. You are not promised tomorrow. You have heard the gospel preached here. It was preached before I ever got in the pulpit. We practiced it as a demonstration. We took the bread and the fruit of the vine. It's representative, symbolic of the body of Jesus Christ nailed to the cross, his blood shed on that cross, that Jesus Christ died for your sins and mine according to the scriptures, and that he was raised on the third day. You've heard the gospel. And if you didn't, I right then just made sure you did because that's the whole thing according to the Apostle Paul. Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. You've heard it. Put your faith and trust in him. It was for you that he died. If you have not surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, I invite you to come as we sing at this time. Come, accept Christ. We wanna pray with you, we wanna to talk to you about what that means. How can you surrender your life to Christ? We wanna get you started. First thing you can do is be baptized. The baptismal is ready. We have clothes and towels in the back so that way you don't have to get your nice church clothes wet. All right? You can get baptized today, that's the first step. The scriptures talk about us being buried with him in baptism, being buried with Jesus and being raised with him to live a new life, an eternal life, one that has hope for eternity, for forever. Surrender your life to Christ this morning. Please come as we sing.